Hello, are you out there? I'm Mark with Homebrew Fever Dreams, plural. This is coming from uh, Lily Northcliffe. Neckbeard thinks bisexual characters too political. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll tell you what's too political. Making fun of neckbeards. There's nothing wrong. No, not all neckbeards are neckbeards. The game, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. The cast, DM, the Dungeon Master. Guy with a little bit of experience as a player, but first time DM. Struggled at times to keep at the plates spinning. Indeed. Or all the plates spinning. Even more challenging. But overall, did all right first first time. Ronnie, elf rogue, and this story's problem player. <laughs> Alex, tiefling bard, and the main recipient of the problem player's problems. Joker, funny dude. Race and class don't matter. Me, me, human, female, sorceress. In game, probably not IRL. Be cool. It would be cool though. Yeah. Our DM set the stage for our first session by having us go into Vandalins Tavern. Am I supposed to know Vandal? Are we supposed to know what that is? Crud. I'm sure we. Okay. I don't, but Fandolin's Tavern. Sounds cool. One at a time as a sort of character introduction scene. The first person into the tavern is Ronnie, and proceeds to find a dark corner to quietly observe everyone else from. I don't like the dark, brooding, loner, rogue cliche, but at least Ronnie was role-playing it, so I was optimistic. Still better than a flavorless, I fire my bow, bonus action, hide, approximation of a character. Next, Alex's tiefling bard enters the tavern with a bit of a flourish, sits down at the bar and orders a drink. But before Alex can pay, Ronnie has jumped up from their corner and offers to pay for the pretty lady's drink. <laughs> Alex hadn't been described as good-looking, mind you. It's a trope for high-charisma characters, but good looks and charisma don't have to go hand-in-hand. Hand. Yeah, so you guys have seen each other's character sheets, obviously. What Alex's player also didn't mention was that the character was the character's gender. Alex's player is female. The player is female, but actually, actually, Alex is a guy. She explained. But thanks for the drink, handsome. I, I always have been partial to the dark, mysterious type. The character's a guy. Alex is a lady female. Is a lady female playing a guy male? Oh, and Ronnie just assumed, because he's he knows that Alex's players of he's just like, hey, pretty lady, let me buy you a drink, and 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 he's like, no, thank you, bro, appreciate it though, good on you. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Ronnie's player was mortified at accidentally flirting with another male character. <laughs> Accidentally flirting with another male character. Oh, oh my bad. <laughs> What's in your pants? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and quickly had him slink back into his shadowy corner. Did he ask for like a read? Could like we retcon that? And everyone's like, no, that that happened. The whole tavern saw it. Oh, someone's slipping out the door to go whisper the secrets around town. Everyone is going to know soon about your proclivity for <laughs> buying guys drinks at the bar. What's going to happen? Ooh. When my character, who I described as rather beautiful and elegantly dressed, sat down next to Alex, this is OP's character, he gave a similar flirtatious introduction. Oh, wow, look at you. Bards up and down the Sword Coast must sing of your beauty. Before I could respond, Ronnie's player had to speak up. Wait, I thought Alex was gay. The guy character played by a girl is gay? Why was he hitting on me if he's into chicks? <laughs> Alex didn't hit on you. Alex just said, thanks for the drink, handsome. Cause, thanks, thanks for the drink, handsome. I've always been partial to dark, mysterious types. For friends. Because I think, hey, they must have interesting stories to tell. Sort of a dark past. I know nothing else about you, and no, I don't want to have sex with you. But I appreciate the offer of the drink. You're very handsome. <laughs> <Yeah>. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Where are we? 
I was a bit taken back by this response, but I think Alex's player was more used to it and coolly explained that Alex is bisexual. You never know. You never know who you're going to encounter, so I wanted to keep the role-playing options as open as possible. Ronnie then said, yeah, oh, okay, whatever. Uh, but can we keep real-world politics out of the game? <laughs> I, I, I know it's really loud when I laugh into the mic. This is supposed to be a light adventure. I don't want to get into all the politics of whether or not you can be bisexual or not. <laughs> no, we understand. I mean, that's whether or not you can be straight or bisexual or gay character in a fantasy world. We don't want to get into that in game, folks. That's not what we play D&D for. Is those deep political conversations like, can a character be bisexual? I mean, is that even... A thing you can do. Uh, 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 let's not get into that debate, okay? <sighs> Crisis averted. Yes, apparently being bisexual is not a personal sexual identity, but rather a political stance. <laughs> the air was a bit tense, but our fourth player, Joker, came in. I sit down at the bar next to the pretty sorceress lady and the pretty tiefling man. Take off my blue math cap and stow it in my bag as a sign of respect to the tavern keeper. If you're confused, he was making a reference to Democratic politician Andrew Yang. <laughs> I, I didn't get the reference, but it's cool. It, Andrew Yang and he was math. He's going to save us all, but yeah, whatever. I get into it. Uh, after the introduction, we're off on our first quest, delivering word of a dangerous dragon in the area to a nearby midwife. She's been harassed by a manticore. We scare it off, and it's pretty basic level one stuff. Ronnie tells us to go and talk to the midwife while he patrols on the edge of the forest in case the manticore comes back. It's actually pretty smart. Manticores are really dangerous for a level one party. Yeah, that's no joke. Um, I object that we shouldn't split the party, but Ronnie says... I'm sure you're more than capable of handling an old woman. Actually, the DM chimes in, Adabra Gwen is relatively young and somewhat attractive, <laughs> somewhat attractive if you like that wholesome farmer's daughter thing. At this point, Ronnie suddenly agrees that splitting the party is a bad idea and he wants to be the one to talk to Adabra to make sure she doesn't try to cheat us or anything. So wait, if it was a midwife, it's an old lady. <laughs> She helps women deliver babies? A hag, I tell you. <laughs> she must be ancient. <laughs> Woo. Okay. This is, a, this is just, this is the story that just keeps on giving. Let's get, I don't even know how, holy, oh my, I'm just looking at the slider bar, you guys can't see it. This is long. Let's keep going. Yeah. Um... We're just here to deliver a message, I explained, and it should be Alex to take the lead because of her, her high social stats. The others agreed, and Ronnie went back to his loner patrol. While well, we took on the Gnome Guard quest, the Gnome Settlement is ruled by a pair of married kings, which uh, really got under Ronnie's skin. I thought we agreed no real-world politics, he said. Look, it's in the module, the DM replied, and gave us their canonical names. Besides, the DM continued to... Kings married doesn't sound like real world po politics. Sounds more like fantasy politics. It's not like it says one of the kings cheated on his previous king with the porn star. Oh, gee. Burn. Wow. Wow. Whew. I don't get the reference, but let's keep going. It's just over my head. I'm sure it's over yours. Someone suggested we get back to the quest because some of the loot sounded cool. We were able to move on. A bit later, though, Ronnie uh, opined, I think out of character, but looking back, I'm not certain. I wonder if there could even be gay tieflings. We all responded with silence, which he took as an opportunity to elaborate. Tieflings are the intentional creation of demons to propagate a demonic bloodline. They wouldn't make gay tieflings since that would defeat the entire purpose. Uh, I don't think it works like that, the DM said. <laughs> Gotta call timeout. OP, are you just messing with us all here uh, on the D&D, on the RPG horror stories, just inserting a politics-laden 
you know, st- horror story? Like, I can't believe anyone would be that, like, bonk you over the head with, like, obtuseness about this. Whew. I'm going to assume that you're not lying to me. Okay? Because... Well, let's not get into it. Let's not get into the politics of who lies and who doesn't lie. Wow, this is hot. This is a hot topic. Time in. <sighs> There'd probably be lesbian tieflings, though, Ronnie continued. Because historically, lesbian women still have still been married off and bore children, so it really wouldn't matter. <laughs> no, it, none of this matters, my friend. We probably should have said something to Ronnie about this, maybe even talked about booting him from the game, but none of us are particularly confrontational. And this was at the very end of the session. So the DM just said, we're at a good point to wrap up and see y'all next week. And you guys just all, you guys aren't going to talk about this. I'll admit, I think there's an interesting question here. What difference would we find among purposely created races as opposed to those that evolved over millions of years? Those races might be rather different from humans in terms of sex and gender. Depending on the purpose they were created for. But it's certainly not a discussion to get into with Ronnie. Yeah. 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 Don't. Yeah. I don't think so. I think Ronnie's um thinking about it way more than he than he should. You know what I'm saying? He's kinda like You know, he just he doesn't get how it would work. You know what I'm saying? Um, that was really the worst of it, but there was an air of awkwardness of, for the rest of the campaign. Alex, Joker, and I all getting along with plenty of jokes between us, and Ronnie uninterested in anything unless he thought there was a chance for slay, pay, or lay. At one point, he even tried to flirt with the ghost of a sea elf we were trying to put at ease. A ghost. Flirting with the distraught, accursed ghost. Ghost. They can age you like from 10 to 40 years in just like a horrible glance. Dude, neither either needs a Pornhub account or he needs to delete his Pornhub account. Not sure which. And as a sidebar, if you've played I Spire Peak, then you know that you do not flirt with the ghost because she will give you crabs. Is that is that true? That, that sounds cool. Uh, <laughs> the campaign eventually came to a conclusion with us defeating the titular dragon of Ice Spire Peak. We raided its dragon horde and made our way back down to Thandalin, returning as conquering heroes. Who is in the tavern when we get back, Ronnie asked. Um, I- I'm not sure why, the DM responded. Well, it's normal for the hero to get the girl at the end of the story, right? <laughs> it was like 1642. Yeah, my friend, but it's not. Um. Whew. I guess that's a common trope. of Fandolin is a small town, only 100 or so people, so it's kind of slim pickings. Ronnie and his player both sulked. <laughs> As the other three of us regaled, regaled, regaled the nearly empty tavern with tales of our conquest. It was like three other people. It's the, bar- the bartender and like an old guy and his dog, and you guys are just talking it up. That's what I'd do. That sounds awesome. The, oh man, this is long. The DM then hit us with an epilogue he homebrewed three days later as we were recovering from our post-victory hangovers. A half dozen very ornate carriages came to town. The Lord of Neverwinter has heard of our conquest and sent one of the middling nobles down. Count, it matters not. Count Amon, <laughs> yeah, he got me. Count, it matters not. Along with him came several knights and lords and ladies from the royal court. This got Ronnie's attention real quick. He got himself out of the shadows and rushed up to the Count, who cares, obviously hoping he could make a good impression and woo a noble woman. Count Nenner remembers the name asked about the source of the treasure, and Ronnie bragged about killing a fearsome dragon. He asked about the amount of treasure, and Ronnie boasted loudly of his wealth. Count Forget About It asked to confirm the treasure was from the dragon's hoard, and Ronnie, again, just boasted about his heroism and wealth. Then Count uh, didn't take notes, informed us that his royal decree signed ten years ago, uh, Lord Never Remembers, claimed 30% of any hoard of a slain dragon, and we would all need to pay our adventuring taxes. The rest of us thought this was funny, a funny way to end the campaign was over, so we couldn't use the money anyways. Ronnie was not having it, though. He tried every angle he could think of to argue why his imaginary money shouldn't be subject to imaginary tax. 
<laughs> Van Dalen is a poor town, he said. People should be happy to have us here spreading our coin. If I'm taxed, I'll just take the rest, go to another city, and spend it there. But if I stay and spend the money, everyone here will prosper over time. You are kidding me. You are kidding me, OP. I don't know if I can finish this. There's just no way... There's <laughs> just no way this happened. It's just... It's just too on the nose. It's just too... It's just too... It's too on the nose. It's just too... Um, uh, roll persuasion, the DM said. But before he could, Alex chimed in, Wait! I don't think that's allowed. Everyone was confused because it's not like this was covered in the rules. Why not? I can make a persuasion check, Ronnie said. It's against the house rules, Alex answered. The DM did not have a clue of what house rules. This isn't PvP. He's trying to persuade an NPC. That sounds a lot like... <laughs> We'll finish it. I'll finish it for you, OP, because I got you got us this far. <laughs> you realize no one under the age of like 40 is going to have any idea what you're talking about here. That sounds a lot like Reaganomics and Trickle Down, Alex said, and we agreed there'd be no real world politics in the game. What? That's not what I. But Joker cut off Ronnie's mid rant. Hey, DM, can I use my money to set up a sort of fund to pay everyone in Vandalin a small amount at the start of every month? You mean UBI, Universal Basic Income, Ronnie asked? That's real-world politics, too. If I can't argue my way out of taxes, we shouldn't be able to have UBI. Technically, Joker said, but UBI only exists in Andrew Yang's imagination. It's more fantasy politics than anything real. Yeah, okay, I'll allow it, DM said. And taxes, Ronnie asked. I'll have to think about it. It's getting late and we're past our normal end time. Joker, Alex, and I thanked DM for running a great campaign. Later, I asked DM about what he decided on the taxes. I booted Ronnie from the server, then seized his goals and used it to fund Neverwinter's first shelter for LG LGBT tiefling youth. The end. Listen, I'm going to have to tag this as not suitable for people that don't want to hear about politics in their D&D. It was a good story. It's very clever. You got a laugh out of me. I can't deny it. Um, <laughs> it's fine. It is on the nose, though. Like I, to the point where I am questioning, like whether this is just like entertainment for us on Reddit, which is totally cool. But you should kind of say that if that's what it is, or you should be like, no, this legitimately happened. <sighs> I am gonna flag it, though. I'm gonna flag political, just because I. I don't want to sucker anyone into that one way or another. Listen, I'm extremely liberal, okay? I am. I'll put that out there. I'm not afraid for people to know that, but I just don't think anyone should have to deal with politics if they don't want to step into that bear trap, either side of the aisle or any political leaning. But, uh, but yeah, good for you guys. Yeah, Take care if you watch.